So here we are with part two of the prologue of the Canterbury Tales. Uh, last time we, we met a number of characters. We met the knight and his son, the squire, and the yeoman. Uh, we learned some lessons through them. The knight's a good guy, uh, really sort of practices what he preaches, one of the few truly good characters outside and in on the um, pilgrimage. Maybe a little bit of Chaucer sucking up to the nobility there. Uh, they are his patrons, after all, and those sorts of things. But it's interesting that the squire, uh, the knight's son, is not nearly as good a guy. So we learned this important lesson that uh, sometimes it, it doesn't matter how good your dad is, like it's no guarantee that the son's going to be a good person, that maybe these things aren't, you know, I guess genetic or don't follow the family line necessarily, because the son is definitely got a girl he's trying to impress, but he's sleeping around on the side, and he's very concerned with his appearance and, and paying all kinds of attention to that. Uh, then we meet some church officials, and Chaucer's pointing out some problems with the church. Uh, we meet a nun, and the nun, I mean, in this incredibly difficult thing to do in terms of uh, writing, Chaucer indicates that she's a nun, but at the same time indicates that maybe she's a whore or a strumpet or, or some, you know, woman who who sells herself for money and he does this through direct and indirect characterization but he's pointing out a problem here how do you know if somebody's involved in the church or not in medieval times there's no certificate that proves and even if there was how do you, nobody can read so how in a medieval world can you prove that you are who you say you are there's lots of people out there who are faking being members of the church maybe to get charity um to get donations to get things like that and and i mean here's this woman who's the opposite of what a church should be then we met the monk uh who is this fat hunter who is in charge of an abbey that he's never at uh pulling a salary and using his salary to go hunting uh and this is a problem in medieval times with second and third sons of, of nobles who go into the church and then just want to continue their rich, opulent lifestyle and not do the work of the church. They're not particularly strong believers. There was nothing in that whole bit that talked about his faith or his belief or what he was doing, uh, right? And this is a problem with the corruption of the church at the time that Chaucer's pointing out. Now we're going to do a few more. You can see that we are about a third of the way through the prologue here. So I'm not going to do the whole prologue. That That would just be ludicrous. Uh, I don't have that kind of time given our schedule. So I'm going to cherry pick some members that we should mention and look at. Uh, I think we're going to look at a friar. Uh, then we're going to go to the wife of Bath because she's a narrator of one of the tales we're actually going to read. Uh, and then we'll look at um, the partner who is also a narrator of one of the tales we're going to read. So we'll look at those three characters. And then we will jump to the ending of the prologue, which sets up the deal and, and the rest of the frame narrative and how it's going to work. And you need to, you need to know that. So let's take a look at the friar. Uh, again, a friar is a church official, um, somebody that you should know, uh, basically somebody who's also taken a vow of poverty. Uh, it's, it's like a preacher who doesn't have a church, and what he's supposed to do is wander around and um, help the sick, help the poor, help the people that can't afford to go to church. That's the job of a, of a friar. So we're going to meet this friar who's supposed to be poor and helping the sick and the lame, and you'll see that he doesn't do any of those things. In fact, he's using his position as friar to... Um, enrich himself and have a comfortable life, which is the opposite of what a friar should be doing. And we'll see the way that Chaucer characterizes this and what this implies about, uh, again, some churchmen and how they're using their positions, not for the purpose they were intended for, but for their own comfort uh, and livelihoods. So we'll, we'll read that. The other thing that you should know about a friar before we start reading this bit is um, in the 50s in America, uh, there was this running joke that if if you had a kid and the kid didn't look like you it was the milkman's kid why well because milkmen came and delivered milk to houses of housewives um, usually in the morning after the husbands had gone to work right and so like there was this, this wink wink nudge nudge like the milkmen are impregnating all the wives because they have access or whatever uh, and the same sort of thing was true of friars in medieval times there was this running joke about friars because they would visit houses and and hear confessions and offer prayers when the husbands were out in the fields. And so Chaucer's playing up that sort of tongue-in-cheek joke 
about friars in some of the sections of this this bit on the friar and maybe that's one of the things that he's got a grievance about and he's trying to make funny in his satire and thereby want people to change but let's let's learn about the friar shall we there was a friar a wanton one and merry a limiter a very festive fellow in all four orders, there was none so mellow, so glib with gallant phrase and well-turned speech. He fixed up many a marriage, given each of his young women what he could afford her. He was a noble pillar of his order, highly beloved and intimate was he with the county folk within his boundary and city dames of honor and possessions, for he was qualified to hear confessions. And you can see that right here off the top. Um, he'd fixed up many a marriage, giving each of his young women what he could afford her. What's the implication there, Chaucer? And then uh, he was a noble pillar of his order. A pillar is, of course, something that holds up the whole edifice, but it's also something that's vaguely phallic in the way that it looks. Um, and he was intimate with the county folk? Intimate? Like, why choose that word? Uh, right? So there's some double meanings here that Chaucer is sure that you're going to get when you hear this. Anyway, he was qualified to hear confessions. Um, Let's learn about that. Or so he said, with more than a priestly scope, he had a special license from the Pope. Does he? I guess we'll never know. Sweetly he heard his penitence at shrift with pleasant absolution for a gift. He was an easy man in penance giving where he could hope to make a decent living. It's a sure sign whenever gifts are given to a poor order that a man's well shriven and should he give enough he knew in verity the penitent repented in sincerity let's translate this so the guy has gives confessions um, back in the day you had to confess your sins to a priest and the priest would give you forgiveness in the name of god and that way you wouldn't go to hell so this friar has a special license from the pope how would you ever know like, if you couldn't read, how would you know whether he had a license or not? He could write whatever he wanted to on a piece of paper and show it to you. Um, so he always gave absolution. He always forgave people for their sins. Why? Well, he was an easy man in penance giving. He didn't give very many penalties. Where he could hope to make a de decent living, if you're going to give him money, he will give you absolution. He will forgive you for your sins if you pay him. Right? It's a transaction. Um, whenever... It's a sure sign whenever gifts are given to a poor order that a man's well shriven, that he's been forgiven. And should he give enough money, he knew in verity the penitent repented in sincerity. So this, this friar, the more money you give, the more sad you must be about what you've done. And so the only way to prove that you're really penitent, that you're really sad about what you've done, is to get rid of your money. Give it to the priest. Right? Can you see what's going on here? Um... For many a fellow is so hard of heart, he cannot weep for all his inward smart. Therefore, instead of weeping and of prayer, one should give silver for a poor friar's care. He kept his tippet stuffed with pins for curls and pocket knives to give to pretty girls. Wait, he uses the money that is given to him to buy pins for curls and little gifts for girls that are pretty? Why does he care about pretty girls? Um... Right, and certainly his voice was gay and sturdy, for he sang well and he played the hurdy-gurdy. At sing-songs, he was the champion of the hour. His neck was whiter than the lily flower, but strong enough to butt a bruiser down. He knew the taverns well in every town, and every innkeeper and barmaid too, better than the lepers, beggars, and that crew. For in so eminent a man as he, it was not fitting with the dignity of his position dealing with a scum of wretched lepers. Nothing good can come of commerce with such slum and gutter dwellers, but only with the rich and victual sellers. So this guy's supposed to be wandering around and helping the poor and the sick. Uh, and instead, he knows every innkeeper. He knows every bartender. He's really good at headbutting people in bar fights. Um, and he doesn't spend any time with the lepers and the beggars because what good can come of it? They can't pay him anything. Uh, he hangs out with the rich and the people who, who sell food uh, to get his meals. But anywhere a prophet might accrue, courteous he was and lowly of service too. So he treats all the poor people really badly, but as soon as he sees a rich person, he acts all lowly and serviceable and, you know, trying to help them out. Natural gifts like his were hard to match. He was the finest beggar in his batch, and for his begging district paid a rent. His brethren did no poaching where he went. Wait, what? Apparently he makes so much money begging 
that he can hire thugs to keep other beggars out of his territory. For though a widow mightn't have a shoe, so pleasant was his holy howdy-do. He got his farthing from her just the same before he left, and so his income came to more than he laid out. So he would take the last dollar from a poor widow and spend it on, you know, whatever he wanted to spend. He's making more money than he spends. He's, he's putting money away. Uh, and he's a beggar. Like, that's what he does. He's a begging priest. And how he romped, just like a puppy. There's a simile for you. He was ever prompt to arbitrate disputes on settling days for a small fee in many helpful ways, not then appearing as your cloistered scholar with threadbare habit hardly worth a dollar, but much more like a doctor or a pope. Of double worsted was the semicope upon his shoulders and the swelling fold about him like a bell about its mold when it is casting rounded out his dress. He lisped a little out of wantonness to make his English sweet upon his tongue. When he had played his harp or having sung, his eyes would twinkle and his head as bright as any star upon a frosty night. This worthy's name was Hubert, it appeared. So there's your friar, a guy named Hubert, uh, but not at all like a friar and abusing his position in the church to get rich and have a comfortable life. Chaucer's pointing out problems uh, with the church again through the characters that he introduces. Uh, merchant, Oxford cleric, sergeant at law, Franklin, they just keep coming. Um, Haberdasher, that's a guy who makes clothes, dyer, carpenter, weaver, carpet maker, cook, uh, skipper, uh, doctor, a worthy woman from beside Bath City. All right, this is the wife of Bath. She's going to tell the second story that we read out of the Canterbury Tales. Uh, it's important to pay attention to her and to know a little about Bit about who she is and uh, what she's after. So let's let's read her and pay attention to what's going on. Let's see, yep, we're at the bottom of the page. A worthy woman from beside Bath City was with us, somewhat deaf, which was a pity. In making cloth, she showed so great a bent, she bettered those of Europe's and Ghent. In all the parish, not a dame dared stir toward the altar steps in front of her. And if indeed they did, so wrath was she as to be quite put out of charity. So that's our introduction to this woman. It's a woman. She's from Bath City. If you know Bath, it's where these old Roman baths were located. Uh, the, the poem, The Ruin, was probably written about it. Uh, but that's where she's from. This is a female uh, who is going to be a narrator of a story. So that's interesting that Chaucer's giving us a woman's perspective. This is a strange woman for medieval times, too. Um, she's older. We get to hear that she's somewhat deaf. Eh? Eh? Right? And that's kind of funny. It'll, it'll provide some humor later. Um, and she's a cloth maker. So she's a merchant. She's a cloth merchant. She makes and sells cloth. And she's the best at her job. Uh, she also is a little bit angry. Um, she likes to be the first at the altar steps in church. And if anybody tries to go ahead of her, she seems to get mad and be quite put out of charity. Um, we'll get some description of her clothing. Her kerchiefs were of finely woven ground. I dare to have swore they weighed a good 10 pounds. The one she wore on Sunday on her head. Her hose were of the finest scarlet red, and garnered tight. Her shoes were soft and new. Bold was her face, handsome and red in hue. Pause. So uh, she is showing off her clothes that she sells by wearing a lot of them all the time. Uh, it shows that she's rich, shows that she's wealthy, um, and everything's well dyed. You know, you get that sense. Uh, she's bold for a woman of her of her time period. Handsome means she's attractive, and her face is red in hue. Well, red tended to mean one of a couple different things. It means, A, you're passionate, B, you're drunk, or C, you're angry. So, like, she's either lustful, drunk, or angry, or all three, um, when you look at her description. Um, I think Chaucer's implying some of these things. Um, a worthy woman all her life. What's more, she'd had five husbands all at the church door, apart from other company and youth. No need to speak of that now, forsooth. Pause. This woman's been married five times. What does that tell you about her? It tells you she is... You can't say she's a strumpet, like she was married to all of them, uh, and they all died. Maybe she's a gold digger? Maybe that's one of the reasons she's rich, is like she marries these older guys and then gets the money. Um, but she seems to enjoy having husbands, and she had other company in youth, which implies that she also had, you know, physical relationships before she was married. Uh, 
next page. And she had thrice been to Jerusalem, seen many strange rivers and passed over them. She'd been to Rome and also to Boulogne, St. James of Compostela and Cologne. And she was skilled in wandering by the way. She had gap teeth set widely, truth to say. Uh, so, which is a weird little detail that she has like Michael Strahan gap in her teeth. Uh, but she's a world traveler. Again, strange for a woman at this time. She's been on pilgrimages by herself to Jerusalem and Rome and Boulogne. She seems to find a new guy at every one of these places, it seems, and marry him. But there was no divorce in those days. All of her husbands must have died. Uh, easily on an ambling horse she sat, well wimpled up, and on her head a hat, as broad as is a buckler or a shield. She had a flowing mantle that concealed large hips. Her heels spurred sharply under that. In company, she liked to laugh and chat and knew the remedies for love's mischances, an art in which she knew the oldest dances. So she wears a really big hat, like a shield, on her head to sort of disguise how big her hips are. She's sort of pear-shaped. That implies that she's had a lot of kids. Um, and when you, when you read the last couple lines, it tells you what her story is going to be about. It says, she knew the remedies for love's mischances and art in which she knew the oldest dances. She considers herself to be an expert on love. She's had five husbands. Why not? Uh, and so her story is going to be about love and what love means between a man and a woman. And, and that's going to be the, the matter of her discussion. So uh, it's important to know about the wife of Bath because we're going to read the wife of Bath's tale, which really is. It's a story of love. Um, it introduces the parson. He's another genuinely good character. He's of, of low birth and really devoutly believes in the church and the church's word. So Chaucer's not always negative to, toward the church. He thinks there are people that are good people that are associated with it, just not the rich people who get involved with it. Um, moving down, uh, we got other characters being entered. The plowman. The plowman's a brother of the parson, also a good guy. Um, the summoner, not a nice guy. The miller, um, the manciple, uh, there's there's lots of people. The reeve, we could meet them all if we wanted to uh, and do some analysis, but I don't think there's there's any reason to do that because um, we certainly have, have done enough. We'll just look at the last character, this guy, the partner, and uh, we need to know him because he's the first story we're going to read in the Canterbury Tales uh, when we come back from break. So... Let's let's meet the partner. First off, what is a partner? You need to have a little bit of context to understand what's going on here. A partner is a guy who sells pardons. Uh, pardons are forgiveness for sins that you actually literally just buy. The idea is that you, you purchase them and the money then goes to the good work of the church and thereby your giving of money to the church actually sort of balances out whatever the evil act that you've done. You can actually buy them in advance. Let's say you were going to go to Vegas and you were going to be bad. Um, you could buy pardons for the things that you were going to do in Vegas ahead of time, and you'd be all set. Uh, now, this is very corrupt, right? And and this is one of the reasons that uh, Martin Luther uh, founded Lutheranism and Protestantism and broke away from the Catholic Church because of corrupt practices like pardoning. Um, the Catholic Church also had sort of three destinations when you died in the Middle Ages. You could die and go to hell if you were bad. You could die and go to heaven if you were good. But most people died and went to a place called purgatory, which is in the middle. You haven't lived a good enough life to go to heaven. You haven't lived a bad enough life to go to hell. You're in purgatory. And purgatory had these levels, and over time you would work your way up the levels and eventually ascend to heaven. But it would take forever, and you could actually get pardons for your dead family members who are in purgatory and buy them up a level or two in purgatory and get them closer to heaven. Um, you know, it's a money-making scam is essentially what this is. And it was a problem with the Catholic Church at the time. Um, this partner is especially bad because there's no indication that he's actually involved with the church at all. Uh, in fact, it, it seems like he's taking the money and lining his own pockets with them. And so what good is a pardon if you get it from somebody who's not officially associated with the church? Does that pardon even function? You think you're forgiven for your sins, but are you? Uh, these are the questions Chaucer is starting to ask. And again, just like with the nun, how do you know somebody's actually a church person um, or not? All you have to go on is, is what they look like. So let's meet the partner. Uh, I've talked enough about him. Uh, the summoner and a gentle partner rode together a bird from Charing Cross of the same feather. Just back from visiting the court at Rome, he loudly sang, Come hither, love, come home! The summoner sang deep seconds to this song. No trumpet ever sounded half so strong. 
This partner had hair as yellow as wax, hanging down smoothly like a hank of flax. In driblets fell his locks behind his head, down to his shoulders which they overspread. Thinly they fell, like rat tails, one by one. This guy's got ugly yellow hair that's all dreadlocky, like little rat tails hanging down. I mean, to compare his hair to rat tails, why choose a rat? Uh, is Chaucer implying that this guy's a bit of a rat himself? I think so. I think we're we're picking indirect characterization details when you look at them that you can sort of see a, a symbolic connection with. Um, he wore no hood upon his head for fun. The hood inside his wallet had been stowed. He aimed at riding in the latest mode, but for a little cap his head was bare, and he had bulging eyeballs like a hare. He'd sewn a holy relic on his cap. His wallet lay before him on his lap, brimful of pardons come from Rome, all hot. Pause. So he should be wearing a hood, that's part of his uniform, but no, he wears a little hat because it's more fashionable. So this guy's more interested in fashion than, you know, the, the uniform that he's supposed to wear as a partner. Also, he sewed a holy relic on his hat, some, some, this is, this is a, another thing Chaucer had a problem with with the church is uh, a lot of guys sold holy relics. Uh, the church theoretically believed in in God and you know that you shouldn't have any um, what we're doing idols. You shouldn't worship anything but God. But they're constantly dealing in holy relics. Like it's a piece of the true cross on which Jesus was crucified. It can help you heal your wounds. Or hey, these are the bones of Saint. Augustine, you know, or the skull of St. Cuthbert or whatever. And these relics were worshipped sort of in their own way. In fact, they're going to uh, St. Thomas's tomb to pray to his bones. It's a very strange and not traditionally in line with Christianity sort of idea. And so this partner apparently sells relics as well as pardons. You can buy little bits and pieces of saints' bodies or clothes or, you know, the, the shroud of Turin or, or whatever it happens to be. Um, so there's that. Uh, let's see, where are we? Oh, he has pardons in a wallet on his lap. Uh, all come from Rome, all hot. Hot is an indication that they're fake. He's got these, these pardons from Rome, but they're all fake. Hot merchandise, you ever heard that phrase? Uh, it's not real. So, or stolen, maybe he stole them from another another partner. It's hard to say. He had the same small voice a goat has got. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why he's got a goat voice, but he does. His chin no beard had harbored nor would harbor, smoother than ever a chin was left by a barber. I judge he was a gelding or a mare. Pause. This is direct characterization. I judge he was a gelding or a mare. Well, a mare is a female horse. This guy can't seem to grow a beard. Is he cross-dressing? Is it really a girl? Uh, the other option, and this is what a lot of scholars have suggested, is that the partner might be one of the first depictions of a gay man in um, any kind of literature. Now, we're dealing with medieval times when people being gay was not tolerated and would be looked down upon, and certainly this partner has a negative uh, representation, but if he can't grow a beard, and he's got long blonde hair, um, and he's got a goat voice and a gelding. A gelding is a male horse who has been fixed, right? Like he's been chopped off. Uh, and so this guy is, you know, maybe a, a Castrano. He's, he's been castrated or something. I don't know. Um, we, got, we got that going on. Um, I judge he was a gelding. I'm <coughs> sorry, or a mare. As to his trade, from Berwick down to Ware, there was no partner of equal grace. For in his trunk he had a pillowcase, which he asserted was Our Lady's Veil. He said he had a gobbet of the sail St. Peter had, the time when he made bold to walk the waves, till Jesus Christ took hold. He had a cross of metal set with stones, and in a glass a rubble of pig's bones. And with these relics, at any time he found some poor upcountry parson to astound, in one short day in money down he drew more than the parson in a month or two, and by his flatteries and prevarication made monkeys of the priest and congregation. Pause. He sells fake relics. He has a pillowcase that he says he's, is the veil of the Virgin Mary. He has a piece of cloth that he says is a bit of the sail uh, St. Peter had um, when Jesus walked on water. He's got a cross of metal set with stones, claiming it's gold and gems, probably. Uh, and in a glass of rubble of pig's bones, which he probably says is the bones of some saint. And 
whenever you find some poor backwards country redneck, whatever you want to like, whatever insult you're trying to get across here, um, he talks him into buying these things. And, you know, like they have a drive or whatever and get the money together from the village to, to pay for these relics, which are going to help heal them and give them good crops and stuff. And the person walks away or the person, the, uh, the partner walks away rich and the village got pig's bones in a glass, right? This is a problem, Chaucer says. In fact, um, there's this running joke among historians, like they've, they've looked at accounts of how many churches had bits of the true cross. And the idea is that there were so many churches that claimed to have a, a bit of the true cross that it was more wood than you could, than you could, you know, have in a cross. It was enough to build a barn. Um, so a lot of these relics just had to be straight fakes. And yet they were worshipped as if they were real. And this partner is, is highlighting that problem that the medieval church has, uh, among other problems. This guy's problematic in every possible way. Uh, anyway, let's keep going. Um, but still to do him justice, first and last, in church he was a noble ecclesiast. How well he read a lesson or told a story, but best of all he sang an offertory, for well he knew that when that song was sung he'd have to preach and tune his honey tongue, and well he could win silver from the crowd. That's why he sang so merrily and loud. Apparently he's really good at telling a story or a lesson, but the best thing this partner's good at is singing the offertory. That's a song they sing when they hand around the plate in church and everybody puts money on it, because that's he knows he's getting paid, and that's what he's he's all after really sort of a despicable guy. We're going to hear his story among others. So um, now we're back to the frame narrative again. We've introduced all the characters in a giant line, and we're going to get to uh, the bargain that they make and how it comes about. Now I have told you shortly in a clause the rank, the array, the number, and the cause of our assembly in this company and Southwark at this high-class hostlery known as the Tavern, close beside the bell. And now the time has come for me to tell how we behave that evening. I'll begin after we had alighted at the inn. Then I'll report our journey stage by stage, all the remainder of our pilgrimage. But first I beg of you, in courtesy, not to condemn me as unmannerly, if I speak plainly and with no concealings, and give account of all their words and dealings, using their very phrases as they fell. For certainly, as you all know so well, he who repeats a tale after a man is bound to say, as nearly as he can, each single word if he remembers it. I'm going to pause there for a second. This is Chaucer's giant disclaimer, and it's brilliant. He's like, you know what? Don't get mad at Chaucer if rude things come out of this. I am i have to tell the truth. I'm honor-bound to tell the truth, and I'm just going to tell things as they happen. So if the partner upsets you, don't get upset at Chaucer for writing about the partner. Get upset at the partner for being the partner. I'm just reporting things as they actually happen. It's hilarious because he made these things up and then he pretended they were real so that you couldn't get mad at him about making them up. Smart guy, Chaucer. Um, However rudely spoken or unfit, or else a tale he tells will be untrue. The things pretended and the phrase is new. He may not flinch, although it were his brother. He may as well say one word as another. And Christ himself spoke broad and holy writ, yet there is no scurrility in it. And Plato says, for those with power to read, the word should be as cousin to the deed. Further, I beg you to forgive it me if I neglect the order and degree, and what is due to rank in what I've planned. I'm short of wit, as you will understand. This is my favorite last disclaimer. Um, the last thing Chaucer says is, if something insults you, I didn't mean it to insult you. I'm just, I'm just dumb. I'm a dumb commoner. I can't be expected to write as well as, as nobility, you know, like just be aware that if something's insulting, it wasn't intentional. <laughs> oh God, I love it. Uh, and he backs us up, actually. We're not going to read any of Chaucer's stories, but Chaucer wrote some stories attributed to himself as a character in this, and he went out of his way to make his own stories the worst ones. They are terrible and boring and awful, and he does this on purpose so we can substantiate the idea that he is not a great storyteller, and he's just telling them as they were told. It's brilliant and it's genius, and I, I respect respect him for it. It's, it's great stuff. Anyway, back to our story. Our host gave us great welcome. The host is the innkeeper, 
Um, and he's going to be a character that goes on this this pilgrimage too. Our host gave us great welcome. Everyone was given place and supper was begun. He served the finest victuals you could think. The wine was strong and we were glad to drink. A very striking man, our host withal, and fit to be the marshal in a hall. His eyes were bright, his girth a little wide. There is no finer Burgess in Cheapside, bold in his speech, yet wise and full of tact. There was no manly attribute he lacked. What's more, he was a merry-hearted man. After our meal, he jokingly began to talk of sport, and among other things, after we'd settled up our reckonings, he said as follows. Now, I think it's important to note that he waits to see if they're all going to pay him, and once they all pay him, then he says this. The, that order is important. Truly, gentlemen, you're very welcome, and I can't think when, upon my word, I'm telling you no lie, I've seen a gathering here that looked so spry. No, not this year, and as in this tavern now. I'd think you up some fun if I knew how, and as it happens, a thought has just occurred, to please you, costing nothing, on my word. You're off to Canterbury. Well, Godspeed. Blessed St. Thomas, answer to your need, and I don't doubt, before the journey's done, you mean to while away the time in tales and fun. Indeed, there's little pleasure for your bones riding along, all dumb as stones. So let me, then, propose for your enjoyment, just as I said, a suitable employment. And if my motion suits you and you agree, and promise to submit yourselves to me, paying your part, playing your parts exactly as I say, tomorrow as you ride along the way, then by my father's soul, and he is dead. If you don't like it, you can have my head. Hold up your hands now and not another word. Well, our opinion was not long deferred. It seemed not worth serious debate. We all agreed to it at any rate, and bade him issue what commands he would. My lords, he said, now listen for your good, and please don't treat my notion with disdain. This is the point. I'll make it short and plain. Each one of you shall help to make things slip by telling two stories. On the outward trip to Canterbury, that's what I intend. And on the homeward journey, way to journey's end, another two tales from days of old. And then the man whose story is best told, that is to say, who gives the fullest measure of good morality and general pleasure, he shall be given a supper paid by all here in this tavern in this very hall when we come back again from Canterbury. Pause. So we have the terms of the deal, which is created by a crafty innkeeper. Okay, he sees that everybody here has paid their bill. There's 29 of them, um, 30 with Chaucer. That's a lot of people. And they all paid. It was a big payday for this guy, and he's super happy about it. And so how does he guarantee that they all come back to his inn and stay another night? <laughs> well, he decides that he's going to go with them to Canterbury, and he comes up with this idea where they're all going to tell stories, two on the way there and two on the way back. That makes 120 stories in all. And it's going to entertain them, and he's going to be the judge. And uh, he'll judge whose story is the best story. And whoever has the best story, and the two criteria are general pleasure and morality, it's got to teach a lesson, and it's got to be generally entertaining. Um, whoever, teaches, whoever tells the best story is going to get a free feast paid for by everybody else. So not only has he guaranteed that they're all going to stay at his inn, but he's guaranteed that they're going to have a feast when they get to the inn. And they're all going to pay for it. One of them's going to eat for free, whoever told the best story. But this is smart on his part, and he's clearly, uh, he's clearly manipulating them to achieve his ends. Um, all right, let's finish this up. Let's see. And in the hope to keep you bright and merry, I'll go along with you myself and ride, all at my own expense and serve as guide. I'll be the judge, and those who won't obey shall pay for what we spend upon the way. Yeah, now, if you do not play your part. If you don't tell your stories, you have to pay for everybody's meal the entire time. Now, if you all agree to what you've heard, tell me once without another word, and I will make arrangements early for it. Of course we all agreed. In fact, we swore to it delightedly and made entreaty too that he should act as he proposed to do, become our governor in short, and be judge of our tales and general referee, and set the supper at a certain price. We promised to be ruled by his advice. Come high, come low, unanimously thus, we set him up in judgment over us. More wine was fetched, the business being done. We drank it off, and up went everyone to bed without a moment of delay. Early the next morning, at the spring of day, up rose our hosts and roused us like a cock, gathering us together in a flock. A cock is a rooster. I think we went over this before. Um, 
And off we rode at slightly faster pace than walking to St. Thomas's watering place. And there our host drew up, began to ease his horse, and said, Now listen, if you please, my lords, remember what you promised me. If even song and matins will agree, let's see who shall be first to tell a tale. And as I hope to drink some good wine and ale, I'll be your judge. The rebel who disobeys, however much the journey costs, he pays. Now draw for a cut, and then we can depart. The man who draws the shortest cut shall start. And so it ends with them drawing straws, which is a very liberal and, I guess, democratic kind of way of, of doing this. Drawing straws to see who will go first. Now Chaucer is brilliant because the guy who draws the first straw is actually the knight. And so Chaucer makes it random that the knight goes first, but it's also culturally appropriate that the highest ranking person would go first and nobody can complain. So he continues doing what he's doing. But that's the end of the prologue. We've set up the frame narrative. They're all traveling to Canterbury. They've made this deal where they're all going to tell two stories. And whoever tells the story that has the best moral lesson and is the most entertaining is going to win a free feast paid for by everybody else. And uh, so keep that in mind as we read the tales. And we'll try and decide which one you like the best. All right. I'm going to stop it here for the day.